Estate for Internationalization, Eurico Brilhante Dias. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to see you. What are your expectations for the sector, considering that we will have elections and uh, our uh, policy in terms of exports and our bet in terms of uh, companies to enter external markets depends on what's to come. Of course, I am an optimist and the Portuguese uh, politics is unanimous in our purpose uh, towards internationalization and also to draw direct uh, foreign investment. In that context, there are very positive aspects of the Portuguese economy, not just the consensus, but the demonstration for the outside of our external policy focused on internationalizing the Portuguese economy and showing our policy of continuity and our bet in legal uh, safety and security of people who invest in Portugal and what we want to sell abroad follows rules of stability and also the legal and financial incentives with the political priority within different markets. This sector specifically, let me tell you, that is the sector with more exports in the Portuguese economy. The metal work industry sector, especially metal work in general, exports metal parts for automobile sector, also machinery and equipment, also the molds. The molds are an important aspect of this industry. And when we benchmark the sector, when we analyze it, we can see the uh, significant amount of exports, which makes a difference in diversifying the Portuguese markets. Notwithstanding our focus on uh, Spain, France, Germany, and the UK for a sake of proximity, we also export for dozens, uh, almost a hundred different countries all over the world. Uh, to give you an idea, the mold industry, and not only when we have the uh, injection part in molds, they export for over 80 countries. The mold sector alone, we're talking um, about metal and the set of uh, the Portuguese industries in metal work, also car industry, mold industry and equipments. It is clearly a sector with a very important significance in Portuguese exports. If we sum up the car industry, it represents around 20% of our Portuguese exports. And of course, this is between 18,000 to 19,000 uh, million euros a year. And this is a central sector in our internationalization policy for the country. We have structural issues that still exist. And I always start my presentations by admitting these because it helps us understand how important internationalization is. Uh, the public debt, the family debt, and also the company's debt. This is a debt that decreases our conditions to resort to uh, third parties' capital in order to grow. If we want to create opportunities, if you want to create a society for citizens to have good opportunities in the labor market, we really need to draw foreign investment, external resources, and also serve the uh, external. We've always had a positive balance between 2012 and 2019. In 2020, the results were different because of the pandemic crisis with a very strong reduction 
in the service sector and air transportation and tourism. We are growing 20% this year compared to last year. And above all, we are growing 4.5% 4, 4 compared to 2019 in the same period. And we have been building a set of incentives, both financial and legal incentives, to diversify our markets. And therefore, the number of Portuguese companies exporting for a single market have, have been uh, coming down. And the ones that export to more destinations uh, are growing because we've had in four or five years period, 3,000 new entries of Portuguese companies in new markets. And this phenomenon, which goes together with the growth in direct foreign investment has decreased in 2020, but increased in 2021. And it got us above 70% in terms of stock of direct foreign investment. Uh, within the GPD, GDP, I'm sorry. And in the industry, it has a modernizing role. And among the 20 largest exporters, we have uh, quite a few foreign, direct foreign investment companies and one fourth uh, companies, one fourth of the companies are of uh, direct foreign investment. Therefore, internationalizing the Portuguese economy is crucial and the metalwork industry plays a very important role. That is the reason why we have to provide uh, adequate opportunities in order to stay in Portugal, keep living here with a good um, quality of life. And it's decisive. This is a decisive moment. We want to attain a goal in 2019. We had 44% of exports in the GDP, but we want to reach 50% of exports. And this is possible by two different means, increasing the level of exports, increasing the number of exporting companies. This would be fundamental and here we have some vulnerability because it's been very difficult to increase the number of exporting companies in 2020 we had to go backwards around 700 companies we have 10 to 11,000 companies exporting continuously and during the past five years uh, 2016 to 2020 more than 34,000 companies exporting goods, but only 10 to 11,000 that exported every year since 2016 and 2020. We have a lot of discontinuity in the sector. And this irregularity forces us to lose the momentum because we have these companies in the external market that increase the relative value of external uh, demand and this difficulty of in terms of retention has to do the fragmentation in this sector the uh, metalwork industry sector in its in uh, collectively has five to six thousand exporting companies a very significant figure which demonstrates that why 25 percent of the companies of in the exporting se uh, sector is connected to metal in some way. Obviously, we have the spending uh, matter responding to this issue of retaining SMEs, particularly in the exporting sector. And we want to diversify markets, obviously. The European Union countries are our main destination in terms of exports. And even though tourism and air transportation have decreased, we 
uh, kept uh, exporting goods. But we want to diversify markets. We want to reinforce our exports fundamentally in two areas. One, the Americas, particularly North America, United States, Canada, and Mexico. These are markets where we've had promoted very strongly uh, our, our goods and services in the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And in Canada, particularly during the past few years, we had the official visit by the Prime Minister in the United States, also the President of the Republic and the PM, and in Mexico, also the PM visiting. And we have been investing a lot, looking uh, for in increasing the market share in those markets. And when we look at our 10 largest export markets, United States play an important role. They are our second extra EU uh, market, considering that the UK is now a non-EU market. And then we also have in, on the same list uh, Morocco. We have European markets and then North America playing a decisive role. The second dimension is uh, regarding proximity markets outside the EU with historical or geographical proximity. The ones with geographical proximity require an investment in the relationship with Maghreb, especially Morocco and uh, Algeria. And in the Moroccan market, one of our it's one of our main markets. It's on the top, top 10 of exports. And in the integration of the free market Maghreb uh, area has new export opportunities with Europe in the case of Morocco. This is the market that has increased exports, our exports during 2021. And also historical and linguistic proximity within the Portuguese speaking community. Europe has had a substantial decrease on the price of fossil fuels, an increase on the price of fossil fuels. And Mozambique is relevant because we will celebrate 200 years of independence, the first importer of the first uh, emperor of Brazil was also a king of Portugal, and these relationships with Brazil are very important. In 2022, we will invest in reinforcing our economic relationship with Brazil. Considering this set of priorities, we uh, should have the country reaching 50% of the share the weight of exports in our GDP. This was a goal for 2025, but due to the pandemic crisis, we uh, plan to do it, to attain this goal until 2027. And it's possible, it will be possible to retain more companies as exporters, and if we move forward, to have a larger market share of Portuguese companies uh, in the markets in the EU, EU and outside the EU. The Recovery and Resilience Plan, Portugal 2030, the multi-annual uh, plan, and even the current execution during the next two years for the current plan will bring new opportunities. And the country has been discussing the endless, apparently endless volume of financial resources during the next few years. If we don't know where we are going, if we don't have a clear plan, these funds will not be used well. So we need to consider an adequate strategy for development, increasing the competitiveness of the Portuguese economy and opening up the Portuguese economy as well. There are no protectionist solutions in the country or the EU that make the country better, uh, richer, and with more opportunities. So when we consider a context 
which demonstrated during the pandemic crisis that the European Union uh, should be more resilient and work with the internal market and also the proximity uh, market, we cannot forget that as a whole, the country has always been better when it opened up. We've always been wealthier when we looked outside ourselves. And it's, it's always possible to have a Portuguese society with more opportunities, with more relevance in the geopolitical context and geostrategic context when we opened up to the world. Uh, so this is my message. In a moment when we have this government reaching a conclusion after the 30th of January 2022, and the new government will assume power during the first quarter of 2022, so we cannot waste time. Whatever happens, internationalization should keep a priority in our country. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to ask you a question before you go. You stress during this intervention the need to retain Portuguese companies in our exports and also the uh, tax and financial incentives. So I would ask you to what extent these uh, tax, tax incentives could be a leverage for these companies because many of them complain of uh, so many taxes that they have to pay when compared to other countries, even within the EU. And this is the reason why some of these companies outside of Portugal can penetrate external markets better than we can. This is the end of the year. We will no longer have a state budget after the end of the year. We'll have a new budget next year. How can this affect the situation for Portuguese companies? That is a very relevant question. My first observation is that Portugal does not have a tax load above other countries of the European Union. Within the 27, it's just uh, slightly above. And the tax load on, if we have lower wages, obviously, there, are, there is less revenue available for the family. And we're talking about the uh, taxes to companies. We should be careful when considering this. The uh, next government will have to reflect on this in three different dimensions. Uh, also, when considering corporate taxes, obviously, Within the international framework, there's a huge competition to attract foreign investment. And this is one of the areas I work on. Capitalizing companies is something which is also connected to the ability to obtain and retain results. If we look at the reality, when we have to pay more taxes, it is more difficult to have net results, to have more reserves that increase the capitalization of companies. Capitalizing Portuguese companies is crucial. We will not retain, we don't retain more companies in exports because SMEs should have more conditions to increase their capital, but for that, there are three different issues we have to face. First, if we do it transversely or through support to the investor, and in this discussion, the option of the government and also the previous government is to reinforce gradually the in uh, the incentive to the investors, for example, research and development. Also, 
the incentives to investment and the incentive systems for capitalization, non-distribution of results, and its incorporation in this is the path that we have tried uh, to take. And then we could have a transversal approach of corporate taxes. The government has chosen a, an option that has more transaction, transaction costs. There are companies that are not investing, they are not retaining results because they are not uh, hiring and we want to reduce the deficit so it is important in 2022 to reduce the deficit when compared to 2021 and we have to be below the previous percentages because of the pandemic crisis this is even more urgent and I'm very favorable to this dimension to support those who are exporting, who are investing, who are internationalizing their companies. Then we have a third option. If we shouldn't maintain what was used in the budget for 2021, which will be discussed in 2022, if we don't want to reinforce the instruments for external activity through incentives, I think we should maintain the support to external production through tax incentives and also increasing the support to companies that collectively with uh, entrepreneurial associations create internationalization. So through tax incentives, we want to reward people who are making an effort to attain the goal, not just the 50%, but also generating more opportunities and creating more external capital flow. And we cannot focus simply on the tax dimension. It is important, but we have financial incentives for internationalization and the challenge for the next community framework will not have uh, tax incentives for larger companies because Brussels and the European Commission uh, prevent us from um, supporting this type of activities. Specifically for investment in machinery, equipment and buildings, we will have limitations in supporting larger companies using the EU resources. And so we have to understand if we will be capable of using public Portuguese resources. If we use uh, public Portuguese resources at the current level with the current figures in 2021, this would imply to have 100 to 150 billion euros every year for drawing the um, foreign investment and to maintain a line of support to draw new direct foreign investment for new units, for new qualified employment, or instead to have a reduction of the corporate taxes. In my opinion, we need more foreign capital and that would be a priority. These are the issues that will be discussed during our campaign before the elections. Uh, we'll uh, clarify this situation, how to use corporate taxes to uh, attract direct foreign investment and support those who invest. Thank you, Mr. Secretary of State. We have external examples like Ireland because of uh, the tax load they had a significant internal investment. Secretary of State, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your presence. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, the media and also the Portuguese Association for Metal and Mixed Construction, uh, especially with Simões da Silva and Professor Lamas, who sent me the invitation.
Thank you so much for thinking of me. It was a pleasure to be here and I wish you a good day of work. Thank you and good morning. After listening to uh, Secretary of State for Internationalization, we could listen to some clues about what will happen because we will have elections at the end of January. But there is this promise, regardless of who uh, will be the, the next government, that regarding economic policies, like the Secretary of State for Internationalization has said, they will maintain this vision, this consensus on the need for internationalization of the Portuguese companies and the need to uh, have tax incentives to help our companies to export. And we will now listen to the president of ISF, Mr. Luís Castro Henriques. It is such a pleasure to participate, even though remotely, in the 13th conference of the CMM. First, I would like to thank the board and all the partners of the association for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to share some ideas with you. Your sector, and you know it well, is a very relevant sector for the Portuguese GDP, around 2% 2 of the Portuguese GDP. Apart from that, it's um, more or less 2 billion euros in exports, 30,000 jobs, and a dynamic activity in exports. With the information we've gathered this year, there has been a positive development and growth. For that same reason, it is important to recognize our trend for the future and see how can we keep growing and going further, taking advantage of new opportunities. Please notice that at ISEP, we believe that in your sector, there will be very good opportunities in Europe and the opportunities for diversification. So my first appeal is to count on us. We have around 50 delegations around the world. We are represented almost everywhere particularly Europe, North America, Africa, South America. And these delegations are used to identify partners so that we can conquer and attract new markets, new clients. We believe that your sector has everything to become a success, more competitive and more international. And I'm very interested and um, impressed to see that 170 markets are being reached by your sector. And the second topic I would like to share, because of the current framework in, in Europe, there is a, a dimension of sustainability of uh, manufacturing our products. So my message, which I believe is important for nowadays, the sector should take a look at this and consider it in their policies, because we have markets you export to where sustainability is absolutely crucial in order to keep these exports. The best approach is to analyze and incorporate sustainability in your practice as soon as possible. Furthermore, ISEP will set up uh, workshops that you can use. Please, if you are interested on this matter, and if you have this type of vision, use our services, use our materials that we have promoted to help you go far. Thirdly, I would like to leave you this challenge. This year, as you know, we had a large campaign with uh, the sector of construction materials and home made in called Portugal. Made in Portugal Naturally. And this campaign had a huge impact in terms of new contacts and networking, new buyers, and also keeping contacts with current buyers of Portuguese products. 
And the most interesting thing was that we conveyed a message of quality and innovation of our products in traditional sectors and in traditional products, thanks to technological innovation and design, innovative design, we were able to create new modern products that still surprise the customers and export very far. So my appeal to you is, in the future, we will have cross-selling campaigns and they are important because we can position ourselves in external markets with a scale and dimension that gets the attention of external clients. So please consider this example. This was done in a digital uh, format because of the current pandemic situation. But in the future, apart from remote events, uh, hopefully we will have also presential face-to-face -face events so consider a cross-selling campaign that you could do in articulation with ASAP so that we can have more impact and reach more clients so that the volume of exports in 2019 can be even more in 21, 22 and 23. So I wish you a lot of success for your sector as a whole, particularly in exports. And I greet you, congratulate you uh, for the high quality of the companies of this sector and your good results. I'm sure with our joint efforts, and I remind you that you can count on us, we can go very far. Thank you so much and wish you all a very good work. This was the intervention of Luís Castro Henriques from ICEP in this conference for metalwork industry. And now we will listen to the president of CMM on international steel. Good morning. It is a pleasure to present this project to you. And these uh, previous present presentations by the Secretary of State and the President of ISEP are very much in line with what I'm going to show you in terms of um, having new initiatives towards this common goal to reach 50% of GDP in our exports. This is a shared ambition of Portuguese people and we know we can do it. We are here as a group to try and reach those results. So I would like to present to you a project, a collective project, which is aimed at the associations that conduct the work uh, for the companies sharing a segment or, or a sector of the market. And they have, they set up collective uh, initiatives for internationalization. So this uh, is financed by SIAD and we've called it International Steel. You can see the very nice logo that we use. And the concern has been transversal in all presentations in this conference and should be a concern of ours in everything we do to guarantee sustainability, uh, the sustainability of our planet and have a positive contribution in terms of uh, climate change and climate emergency. So we have the economic performance of our company and they should be taken into account. Throughout this conference, we have uh, demonstrated a very concrete and interesting initiatives in order to attain those goals. So I will uh, give you a presentation of the project and during the next two years, it will be used to mobilize the sector and help us reach new markets, just like we said earlier. This is a collective project 
qualquer setor industrial. And any industrial sector should be ready to adapt quickly. The project was approved, it was designed in a situation where we can never imagine a pandemic coming up and it was based on contact direct contact in international markets and this meant traveling and establishing initiatives uh, both in portugal and abroad the project was approved and we were confronted with the lockdown of the pandemic crisis. We are still suffering the consequences. I don't know how it will evolve. But even before we started, we had to redesign the project, trying to promote in the internationalization and the exports of Portuguese companies, um, considering these new circumstances. We had to do everything remotely. And this is a challenge that the Portuguese companies have embraced because they are used to adapting and readjusting very swiftly with a very clear planning and in a very smart way instead of simply improvising. Because improvising, uh, taking shortcuts is not the best solution. We maintain our goals, reformulating redesigning its implementation implementation trying uh, to get the results as you can see on this slide we are talking about empowering smes in the sector of metalwork construction this is a sub sector of metal and mechanic uh, sector it's the largest national exporter and the subsector plays a very important role in Portuguese exports, above 3% of national exports. And we wanted to help the companies in this continuous task. We have five action points that we identified for the project. First of all, to identify opportunities and constraints in the access to new markets developing internationalization processes that can uh, be sustainable we don't want situations where during one year the company exports a lot and then spends several years without exporting anything we want to give continuity uh, to the companies and uh, provide sustainability uh, considering the diversity of the countries they are working with the third action point was to ensure promotion and communication, that is to communicate to the outside that we have added value and innovation that we can offer to other markets within the logic of the vision for digital development for the whole society and for the specific sector. How can we do this, having a good um, cost-efficient relationship? Through collective campaigns, gathering efforts and trying to work together to communicate, to convey to the outside the ability we possess. And finally, to set up international workshops, trying to understand and make use of the international interest towards our companies so that our companies can uh, use these opportunities to make their business a reality at an international level this is the work conducted by an association and not only by a single company so we had to choose the markets that we wanted to explore this sector like you've heard during this conference, has had a lot of success in its internationalization. And it, it has a significant presence in many different markets. So we wanted to broaden from 80 countries to a, a greater number of countries, of markets, 
Exportações portuguesas. For Portuguese exports. And it's not an accident that the Secretary of State mentioned North America and one of the target countries was specifically Canada. Totally in line with the public policies trying to work together to open up new markets or give them continuity and allow us to gradually implement uh, the Portuguese companies. Canada was one of our options. Russia was also a selected market and the Middle East as well, like the third uh, chosen market. We're talking about markets where the Portuguese presence and specifically in the Middle East is already uh, present in terms of exports, but Canada and Russia were practically new markets for our uh, trade trade actions for Portugal. How could we do this? We will show you the main activities through four uh, different pillars. First, prospection, getting to know the market to help the companies gain access through the organization of this very event this session here today is also the result of these initiatives the portugal steel summit is a showcase um for the from the sector for the international market also creating opportunities for encounter for meetings between portuguese companies and foreign potential uh, clients we had a session yesterday dedicated to the french market for example and the purpose is to focus on those three markets trying to open up new doors uh, of opportunity for the companies also help the companies demystify the the way they can make business and helping them overcome bottlenecks and the red tape in this type of uh, trading we also have business uh, seminars trying to create the b2b contact between different representatives from both sides and we had a second activity empowering the sector preparing the company to be prepared trying to penetrate in those markets through training workshops also creating guidelines uh, a user manual of good practices and trying to identify opportunities and anticipate the new trends for the sector allowing us to make a smart plans to reach those markets the third activity was to promote showcase our products and the supply available disseminating information about the sector as a whole emphasizing the uh, remote contacts online, creating and uh, giving access to digital means within the sector and trying to showcase our supply with more added value, more innovative. And one of our ambitions is to have, like uh, you heard yesterday during your presentation, not to be made in Portugal, but invented in Portugal. Engineer José Teixeira said this yesterday, and it's true. So this is a group of tasks that make it possible to attain these goals. And finally, to disseminate the information about the project effectively, knowing that the sector is located mostly in the northern and central areas of the country and trying to uh, help these companies have a strong presence and international promotion of their products and services. These are 
other activities that have to do with the website. This is the timeline for the initiatives for the year starting today with the Portugal Steel Summit. And then throughout the next year, we will have more initiatives and uh, we are supposed to go to Qatar in the end of 2022 and we hope we can go there in person and talk face to face to uh, our potential clients. Those of you who are interested, please get in touch with us. And the next presentation will uh, give you more interesting information about this to keep discussing how companies can be internationalized. Also, the performance of the sector. And uh, we will now talk, listen to José Gomes, CEO of Mestre Casais, a full professor at the university. He is an MP member. And uh, between 2015 and uh, 2020, he was part of this association. Let's listen to you. Esta CMM ter-me dado a oportunidade uh, e ter-me feito o convite para apresentar aqui um retrato do setor da construção metálica portuguesa. Uh, a picture of the sector in Portugal. My presentation will have four parts, a few considerations. So what is the importance of the steel in the world? Then the features of the sector of Portuguese construction, uh, metal construction, of some presence of Portugal in the world. And finally, a few of the challenges of sustainability applied to the sector of steel. To speak of steel today is to say that it's present in every aspect of our lives, from the toe caps in a shoe to the steel that is in our refrigerator, in cars, in chips. It's present in everything that is the areas of economy society, and it's surely a very important sector. Since 1950, uh, after the war, steel has been produced and used largely. Uh, and when we look at the graph, the production of steel goes up, up until the end of the last century, and then is more or less stable, uh, apart from what the new production starts rising exponentially. In 2019, we produced 1,800 megatons of steel. And the perspectives are for that production to continue to grow due to the demand, the need. And around 2015, we will have the need to produce 3,000 billion, 3 billion megatons, gigatons. Steel is produced in several geographies in the world. If you look at the map, what you verify is that half or around half of the world production of steel is produced in China, then Australia with a component that is very important. And then with another level, what is produced in the US, Canada, in the North American continent and in Europe. The lesson we draw from the map is that the great part of the production, half the production, happens in China. If we look at what is the consumption of steel in finished products, half of that consumption is uh, buildings and infrastructure in construction, half of all the steel produced in the world. The demand, the remaining, uh, we identify three the pro metal products, the equipment, mechanical, and automobiles um, that also uses steel. The subject of recycling, it is common in all areas of construction, natural in metal construction and steel as well. Today, in each new product of steel, we have contained 30% of recycle steel, what we uh, designate as scrap. This percentage will grow uh, of st recycled steel. It means that I am saving in each ton produced one ton and a half of CO2 emissions. I'm also saving 
the iron and carbon and energy and water that are needed to produce the steel. Therefore, today and growing, we see an incorporation of recycled steel. That means that what is the iron um, alloy has less need of being explored. If we look at the sector of construction, metal construction in Portugal, we aggregate uh, several codes of economic activity that include manufacture of metallic structures, but metal works, um, pipelines, etc. All the value chain aggregated, we verify that if we place it in a graph in 2015 up until 2020, which is what is the, the sales, uh, number of sales of the sector of that set of codes of economic activities. What we verify is that it's coming, it's increasing up, up until 2019. We will consider here 2020 due to the pandemic was in a typical year. So we have a growth, sustainable growth of the volume of sales in the area of metal construction in Portugal and corresponds natural to a growth, sustainable growth for the sales in the national market and the sales uh, for exports. If we look at the numbers, we verify that at this moment, we have employed more than 30,000 people in the sector in all the value chain. We verify that the volume of sales is 4.3 billion euros and it corresponds 2.2 percent of the national gdp and we also verify that 1.8 billion euros of production in the section of this sector corresponds to exportations and is three percent of the global portuguese export if i concentrate only in the CHI 25110, the code for construction, manufacture, metallic construction structure, and the variation of the volume of sales throughout the years. Uh, we verified that up until 2010, in the years of the crisis, it was a decrease of the value of production. But we also have here as a growth uh, sustainable growth in the volume of business and the sales for export. In terms of the areas of the country, the geography within the country where we develop activity of con metal construction in Portugal, the graph is very clear, especially in the north and center region of the country, and also to all in Lisbon. But this is an industry that is localized, as you can see, in the north and central part of the country. If we look at the evolution of the employment in the sector of construction, metal construction, what we verify is that naturally after 2010, there was a decrease. It was a period of crisis in Portugal, but after 2015, we see an acceleration that is very interesting up to the point that in 2020, we had an increase, uh, accentuated one of the employment, and it's about 28, 29,000 uh, people working. If we look at the distribution of the uh, volume of business by typology of business, it's a distribution very interesting between micro SMEs and with a small component of bigger companies, then it means this refers to the volume of business and not the number of companies with the prevalence of SMEs. This graph shows that is a graph for, for the United Kingdom, and it shows the distribution uh, between structures of buildings in steel and concrete and masonry and wood. And what we verify is that around 80, 90 decades of last century, the structures in steel dominated um, other structures. If I look now for Portugal and the data we have available, what I verify is that the graph, we have the budget for all the sector of construction in Portugal. 
and also in those years closer to the crisis it decreased but then it began increasing and the green uh, line shows the weight of construction metal construction and the volume of business uh, globally of construction and what we'll see is that the steel gains um, ground and share in that market and it's today worth 22 percent of the business volume of this area of construction there's a few examples of metal construction in the world we have the airport here of Geneva that has a metal structure an impressive one and it is uh, was built a work uh, done by Marty Fair in Portuguese industry. We see here the Tomorrow uh, Museum in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's from Santiago Teletrava Architect. It's a work construct, uh, construction for Marty Fair. We see the facade of a building in Argel. It's a big building. Uh, and Teixeira Duarte was the company responsible with the metal construction of Portuguese industry. We verify also another example, the uh, Le Paris Lanchon. It's a track in Paris, it's an impressive structure and also from our industry included. Also the construction of a pier offshore uh, for supply of gas and oil in with incorporation of Portuguese uh, industry as well. And finally, the uh, Rini Grêmio in Porto Alegre, Brazil, a stadium with a metallic cover, uh, very impressive, and a work done by Marty Fer. These are, uh, this is the frame uh, feature of the sector of metal construction in Portugal. As we can see the importance is relevant, whether in terms of percentage of the GDP, Portuguese GDP, and the share uh, in export, Portuguese exports, uh, as I said, is an industry localized in the center and northern part of the country, and we verify that employs 30,000 people. All this sector in Portugal and the world, this sector of metal construction and steel, is naturally subject to the tensions today associated to sustainability. And 2015 was a critical year for this matter, because in that year it was appro approved the National United Nations Strategy for Sustainable Development that had 17 uh, objectives of um, sustainable development that represent the evolution of society, objectives for which all areas of activity, social, economic of the planet needs to be taxed. In 2015 was approved the Paris Agreement for the Climate Change, COP21 in Paris, an agreement that tells us that if we want to decrease the global temperature to 1.5 degrees regarding what were the levels before the industrial uh, we have to reach carbon neutrality in 2050 and Europe has established the goal to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases in 55% regarding the levels of 1990 in 2030. This is a very ambitious goal for which all the areas will contribute, especially those that represent more parcels of uh, emissions of this greenhouse gases and construction sector is one of them. 38% of the emissions are in this sector. There are other subsectors of high intensity that need energetic and not just carbon, that is cement sector and the steel. Each one will uh, prevail 8%. This estimate said that the demand for steel could double up until 2050. So we are facing a big problem. We on one side need to answer the demand for steel that will increase up until 2050. And on the other side, we will need to be able to foresee that those gas emissions reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases 
significantly. I would say that this challenge of sustainability can be divided into challenges um, if we want. The first, the circular economy. We need to maintain more in the economy. What are the materials that require a lot of natural resource with high intensity of energy and carbon? How do we do that? The directive of the waste uh, has a category of options, different options. The one more favorable, more interesting to the one that is less favorable reducing naturally, starting by the re reduction of the quantity of uh, residues produced, reuse uh, rapidly of those materials by recycling them, recovering of the flow of energy, for instance, and finally, a very interesting option, the terminal one, the landfill. This directive, European Directive of Residues, as great part of the normatives and legislations happening in, in Europe, in the world, they try, try to look at these materials in a logic and approach that is cyclic, uh, cyc life cycle, not just in terms of the carbon produced, but what they represent throughout their life cycle. And there's an instrument, the Declarations of Environmental Products. I will present rapidly too. Just to explain what we have in, in terms of evolution for steel. The first declaration uh, environment for uh, shows a product of steel that produce 26% in high oven and 74% of steel in ovens, uh, scrap, uh, recycling steel. And what we verify in this file is that for each ton of steel produced, we are emitting 1.13 tons of CO2. If we look at this other declaration of environmental product, is also referring to steel, but a specific one uh, that has 100% recycled steel. And what we verify is that it emits only 0 0.33 tons, 30, 33 kilos of CO2, equivalent for each ton produced of steel. And we verify when we compare both, this is more environmental friendly if we want. The second challenge has to do with decarbonization of the production of steel itself. We have here a sector of the steel that in itself has defined as an objective to reach carbon neutrality in 2050. And for that, it defined goals to reduce in 2030, 30% of the emissions of these gases, greenhouse gases, facing the volumes of 2018. So in 12 years, reduce 30% of the emission. It's a very ambitious goal. Uh, we need to retain that today between the process of high ovens, uh, less sustainable, that it, they emit 2.5 2 tons of CO2 by layer of steel produced, and the process is are more efficient with the new technology that emit only 0.3 ton of CO2. Between the two, if we make the average to 2018, um, the average says that we are emitting 1.6 tons of CO2 for each ton of steel produced. There's still too many emissions. We have two ways. One, to improve the efficiency of what is the technology installed, typically the efficiency of uh, production high ovens. And the other is to make a shift, a technological shift that will allow us to advance to the decarbonization completely, almost completely, of the production of steel. And we have an, a technology gaining terrain, DRI, that makes the reduction, direct, direct reduction of iron using and replacing it, the technology, and using uh, here hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, or uh, more green uh, sources of energy to achieve their reduction. Of, and we, I brought this landscape, if you will, this 
scenario of the possibilities and options we have today. It's a frame from McKinsey, an analysis from McKinsey. I think it's very interesting. And in the third columns on the left, they say, that what are the options for reducing CO2, the improvement of efficiency using biomass as reductors or using technology of capture and usage of carbon. And then in the right side columns, the possibilities, new possibilities of new technologies, uh, technological transition that can lead to decarbonization completely. What are we talking about? We are talking about of using the DRI, the, the reduced direct reduction of iron and using hydrogen. Hydrogen has a critical role here. This technology is now almost available, but it's still too expensive. And there's two variables that will determine the competitiveness of this energy. The first is the cost of carbon. How much do I pay for the emission? And this has to do with the European market, European and others. This European is the one we know. And and since carbon increases the prices, it's more advantage to change to another technology to emit less carbon. On the other side, the price of hydrogen is going down. We can see in this graph that is brought by the Hydrogen Council, and we see that these are at values for Germany. In 2020, it's possible to reduce uh, gray uh, hydrogen um, and the cost but it's possible to produce now green hydrogen uh, four euros per kilogram or 4,000 euros for each ton of hydrogen value that is decreasing. And the best estimates say that in 10 years, more or less in 2030, the hydrogen, green hydrogen will be more uh, cheaper than the gray one. And this evolution of the price of hydrogen, we can advance to, and this is my last slide, it's a challenge for what is the map of competitiveness of the new technology of production, highly decarbonized of steel, phase two variables, critical variables. The horizontal X, the price of hydrogen that is going down, if you look, 2.2 euros per ton to 1.78. And on the other side, the price of CO2 in the carbon markets that I have to pay if I emit. And I hope that we'll be increasing. This line that separates the blue line and the gray line results from the combine, combination of the price of hydrogen and the price of carbon that will determine if the new technology is decarbonized, if it's competitive or not, it's cost efficient or not. Uh, for values of two euros uh, that will happen in the next few years, two euros per kilo of hydrogen. If I have the cost of carbon in the zone of 70, 80 euros per ton, the emission cost, it's competitive in the, the new technology. The cost of hydrogen that five or six years ago, it was six, seven, eight euros per ton. Uh, the cost of CO2, I'm sorry, six, seven, eight euros per ton emitted. Now it's 50, 60. And we hope that in a, we expect in a few years, the, the value for ton to, to be paid could reach the zone of 80, 90, 100 euros. When we reach that level, practically any cost of hydrogen will make the new technology competitive. So these are the two variables in terms of what we have on the table for option to produce steel, decarbonized steel. These are the two variables that we need to observe. observe. And today, I know uh, that is an experimental title we saw um, from Sweden earlier. Uh, we are able to produce uh, steel with CO2 emission values lower than 300 kilos per ton. And surely for ton of steel produced, we will reach values even lower. This is the frame I leave you with. Uh, the technology could decarbonize the production of one of the materials more used uh, and which demand will continue to increase, that is steel. Thank you for your attention.
This was the presentation of Jose Gomes Mendes, professor. And now we will look at the Russian market with Alexander Bimino. Thank you, thank you, Cristina, or should I say obrigado now? <laughs> Bom dia. All right, okay, so question? ladies and gentlemen, Moscow <laughs> is on the line. And uh, first of all, on behalf of Eurasian Business Alliance and personally the business ambassador to Portugal and Spain, Mr. Eduard Gulian, I would like to welcome the participants of the Congress. And we are sincerely grateful to the CMM Association for organizing today's conference. It's, it's a great honor and more importantly, it's a great pleasure to cooperate with professionals of this level. So just a few words from my side about the alliance I represent today. Of course, a more detailed presentation you can find on the virtual booths. So I won't take up your time. Uh, the mission of our platform is basically to find and create projects, joint projects, for businesses in various industries in Europe and Eurasia. It means that we are open to Portuguese companies and associations that are interested in working in Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan as well. As a multi-sector project office, we of course cannot overestimate the, the role of, of, of uh, steel uh, construction in this regions. At the moment, we are actively working in various fields, such as agricultural logistics, construction of uh, factories to, uh, for the production, production of food. We are uh, interested in creation of modern medical centers with attraction of international funding. And as you can imagine, it's a huge potential for the application of steel construction technologies. Given the geography of Russia, there is no use to say that in the extreme conditions, climatic conditions of the far north or the, the far east, uh, steel and composite structures may be the only acceptable solution. I'm glad to say uh, that I had a chance to get acquainted with uh, the steel construction projects of Portuguese companies, Africa, in Latin America, as uh, Middle East, uh, like museums, stadiums, airports, and so on. And these buildings, frankly saying, evoke nothing but admiration. On the other hand, I very much uh, hope that the Russian experience will be of interest to the Congress participants today. We clearly understand uh, the importance of international scientific and technical cooperation. In this regard, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, one of the best experts in this field in Russia, Alexander Bibin. Alexander, uh, you have the floor. Alexander, пожалуйста, прошу вас, включайтесь. Okay. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you, Igor, for inviting me to this conference. I'm Alexander Bibin. I'm the head of uh, steel structure design in Evras. Uh, in the steel market development department and I'm in charge of technical sales support. This is my key role and I'm a head of our in-house engineering team here in Nivras. So in addition to that, I'm involved in new product uh, development um, in the direction of uh, steel construction market. So today I'm going to show you a brief overview of some of our activities. Okay, let me start from, from this, uh, let me say, business slide. It uh, depicts the major centers of uh, production of Evras. Uh, here you can see um, that our domestic facilities um, divided into four divisions that are the Ural division, Siberia, Coal division, and Vanadium division. The Ural division operates our biggest asset, the NTMK plant and the KGOC mining and uh, processing facility. Uh, the Siberia division is the, uh, the same K plant, uh, which produces 
mostly uh, the long products and rails. Um, uh, here uh, the coal division with uh, plenty of uh, my coal mines. And apart from that, we um, operated the operate the Euras North America business, where are the Pueb Pueblo and Regina are the main production facilities that produce rail rails and pipes pipes here you can see our financial and operational results of 2020 so let's go back in the russia to the russian market and uh, here you can see what we are the number one among uh, rails beams and uh, structural section producers uh, but despite uh, the high market share we are always try to find uh, the new applications new niches for our premium product which is the beam um, as you can see uh, in the product line we have no any sheet metal coils or plates with this because we are focused on primarily on long products uh, and i would point out that developing the beam uh, market is very interesting for evras because of um, because uh, uh, let me say it's, it's our major product in the russian market uh, after rails and this despite the uh, high uh, market share there are some reasons for action to develop uh, this product okay let's go further so uh, here you can see a simplified scheme of our sales instruments let me say and most interesting market segments to go with the beam saying this i mean uh, the construction markets that are not industrial uh where still beams are dominated let me say construction material or construction component that's why the oil and gas industry and uh, energy industry are not presented at this slide uh, so the basic instrument uh, is our direct sales team me and my engineering team provide technical support for them um, just to increase sales of uh, for smaller clients we started the di digital sales platform which calls the uh, evras uh, market here you can buy what you need via your mobile phone for example uh, and the third third stream among the others is the evras downstream businesses uh, uh, one of them operates directly on at construction market and provide the uh, let me say holistic solutions for customer needs so the company can design produce and even erect the buildings so uh, here is the slide about our steel processing facilities uh, we've got two special steel service centers one of uh, them at the moscow region and one in the ural region uh, and also we have lots of local services uh, this service infrastructure and complex approach let us improve our development strategy um, and today we are moving from direct sales of products to the solutions delivery you can see the examples of that way for instance you can see the uh, solution for uh, some small spans bridges uh, for the for the distance uh, for the distant regions of our country uh, this item consists of uh, all bolted weathering steel uh, this hot roll these beams are hot rolled uh, and uh, this construction is extremely affordable due to its low maintenance cost and beyond that this bridges is 
environmentally friendly because uh, it's made out of recyclable uh, materials. You can see the timber uh, and steel in there. Uh, so uh, one of the most undeserved, undeserved by steel industry market is the residential market in Russian Federation. So here you can see a quick market overview. Uh, uh, the key facts is uh, the residential segment in Russia is the key driver for the whole construction market. And at this time, it, it is rapidly growing. But um, from the other hand, non-residential market is uh, still stable and driven by uh, on the industrial and warehouse buildings. But uh, the share of uh, steel framed solutions and prefabricated solutions, it is still extremely low. It, it's below the one percent of all the of all buildings. So the key trends is the uh, the most the most uh, uh, significant trend is the speed of construction because uh, banks hold uh, one percent uh, one hundred percent of funds until construction is. Uh, uh, done. So the next one is the industry consolidation because of top uh, the top of our uh, top five of our developers in this sector share the about fifteen percent or sixteen percent of all the construction market. So here we got the strong request to decrease the labor force in construction site. And uh, below the slide, you can see the top. Uh, top of developers that uh, announced uh, their own investment in model construction. So um, a few years ago, Yvra started an attempt to increase beam consumption in residential construction and uh, non-residential construction as well. By then, uh, we decided to split our activities to the pair of engineering streams. Uh, both of them was about to increase uh, the prefabrication phase of construction. Thus, we try to develop a product which could bring the opportunity to build faster. So the first idea was about uh, a modular construction. It's quite obvious, I think. And we tried to develop a structural system which could provide an, an extremely uh, fast construction method. So um, when we found a way in volumetric modular with our partner company, partners company now of Prefab. By the other hand, we understood that uh, this kind of technology may not find the proper feedback from the key market players due to their uh, conservative position. Uh, then we thought about how to develop a structural system made out of steel and common construction components. And this way was created the concept of prefabricated steel frame with uh, precast flooring and two dimensional modular walls. So uh, here, a few facts about our modular system. The result of our collaborative work was a structural system which consists uh, of pre-assembled framework of hot rolled beams in addition with a standardized system of floor, ceiling and wall panels for fabricated by partner company. The choose of stiff hot rolled frame make it possible to reach a multi-story concept up to nine floors without concrete core. And the general idea of using the hot rolled beams was about to increase uh, vibrational and acoustic properties of floors, as well as our aim to reach a multi-story concept in modular as well. Mm. The floor and ceiling panels 
are lightweight and the external walls could be finished in any way and have an efficient insulating, insulating function. Both of the light gauge steel and timber options for subframing are uh, available. Mm, the goal of alternative way, let me say, was to achieve a flexible architectural layouts using steel and other conventional and affordable precast and prefab components such uh, concrete slabs or and component of wall systems the result was um, an architectural concept of typical building which has commercial areas on the ground floor and uh, flexible layouts in the living floors all the alexander please can you hear me okay to conclude please okay uh so it seems I, I'm, I'm out of i'm out of yes my time. Okay. yes okay this is this is the, uh, my last slide so uh, thank you for attention if you have any question let's discuss uh, in the chat room later on so thank you again and i will I'm Thank gonna, you. I'm going to show <laughs> the microphone to the uh, Igor, I think. Thank you very much, Alexander Bibino e Igor uh, Svaniev. Uh, spasiba. <laughs> I think that's it. Galegi, Thank spasiba, you very much. Spasiba. <laughs> spasiba. <laughs> <for you. laughs> <laughs> Have a nice day, thank you very much. E agora olhamos para o mercado canadiano com o Alex Martiniak, da Câmara de Comércio da União Europeia. We now go to the Canadian market. Welcome. Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to uh, CMM conference. It's a pleasure to, to be able to present uh, the European Union Chamber of Commerce um, to uh, Portuguese uh, companies, exhibitors, and to all participants of the conference, as well as uh, talk about some opportunities in the construction, uh, steel construction and composite construction um, uh, sector in Canada. Uh, I will um, would like to share my screen and uh, present the presentation. Just uh, uh, one moment, please. Uhum. Vamos ver a apresentação de Alex Martiniak, da Câmara de Comércio da União Europeia no Canadá, que nos vai falar sobre o mercado canadiano. Estamos uh, nesta sessão digital de, do Congresso de construção metálica e mista, e estamos em direto, obviamente, por isso mesmo, por vezes, acontecem estes impasses de espera. Alex, Sometimes please. Sometimes we have these problems, technical problems. Let me just report the full screen. Here you go. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> just actually, um, before I do that, I think I need to start the presentation from the first, first slide. And then we go to the full screen. There you go. Now I'm ready. And you have so, about um, uh, eight yes, minutes the, the <laughs> for your record. presentation. Yes, wonderful. Thank I'll you. be quick. I'll be quick. We, oh, need okay. to, uh, we need to recuperate the time. So uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Um, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to, to present uh, the European Union Chamber of Commerce in Canada. And I am the executive director of the, uh, of the chamber. Uh, our mission is to foster trade and investments uh, between Canada and European Union uh, uh, and with a specific focus on Western Canada. Western Canada uh, uh, consists of four provinces, British Columbia, the uh, uh, westernmost province on the Pacific Ocean, um, and you can see the picture of Van the city of Vancouver. It's just surrounded by ocean and uh, and the mountains. Um, uh, Alberta, um, uh, with the cities of Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, Saskatchewan, uh, the province of Saskatchewan, with uh, the capital city of Regina, and the province of Manitoba, with the uh, capital city of uh, Winnipeg. So we specialize uh, um, uh, most of uh, focus our operations in Western Canada. 
Um, so we are non-profit membership-based uh, bilateral organization. Uh, we've been uh, uh, we, uh, incorporated in November uh, 2013. And um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we work, uh, we, uh, being a bilateral organization, uh, we uh, equally help uh, and assist uh, Canadian companies to do business in Europe uh, and European companies, that is obviously Portuguese companies, uh, interested in doing business in Canada. Um, um, we uh, also work uh, often, uh, uh, organize various uh, activities to increase public awareness of the CETA, uh, a Comprehensive Economic Trade and Agreement um, between European Union and Canada, uh, which not only uh, uh, has brought uh, down, uh, it cancelled uh, nearly 98% of all uh, duties uh, on trade, but also facilitates um, uh, access to public procurement on equal footing for uh, Portuguese, for European companies um, in Canada uh, on all level, uh, federal government, uh, provincial government and municipal government uh, public procurement, uh, but also facilitates uh, jo job mobility, uh, company transfer of employees, um, and uh, uh, also um, recognition of uh, credentials. Um, so, uh, we, we work closely with um, um, our sister organization, which is European uh, Union Chamber of Commerce in Toronto on the East Coast of Canada, and uh, liaison very often with the EU delegation um, to Canada, uh, trade commissioner service, uh, government agency uh, uh, agencies as provincial governments. Um, and our main services are uh, soft landing services uh, as we assist uh, European companies as uh, wanting to set up operations uh, in Canada uh, and the EU, but uh, we focus on Canada right now. So <clears throat> if any companies that would like to uh, set up operations, uh, perhaps uh, bid on uh, procurement uh, opportunities, um, find uh, partners, we are able to, uh, to help them uh, set up, uh, to register the company in Canada, set up operations, organize meetings, uh, both with governments um, and with, uh, with potential partners. Uh, we do feasibility studies, um, uh, business referrals and uh, research for partners, organize uh, B2Bs. Uh, we also organize conferences and business forums. And we will indeed organize uh, in February next year, uh, a business forum and uh, bilateral between Portugal and Canada uh, to help to assist Portuguese companies in finding partners uh, in the construction, uh, in the steel construction and composite construction sector. Uh, so this is just a, a quick presentation of, uh, of our chamber. We also organize uh, uh, and host uh, trade missions uh, um, bilaterally. Um, just quick snapshot of Canada. Uh, it is a uh, uh, world, uh, world's second largest country uh, after our predecessor, uh, Russia, uh, with 10 million uh, square kilometers. Um, uh, territory, uh, population 38 million uh, and constantly growing because of the immigration program. Uh, the GDP is a tenth uh, uh, in the world with uh, one point, uh, over 1.6 trillion uh, US dollars. Um, the, uh, the economy is uh, service and resource based. Uh, and with the fact, uh, fast growing uh, technology and manufacturing sectors. There's two official languages in Canada, French and English. And uh, with the focus on Western Canada, um, uh, I'd like to present uh, the most important two provinces in, in the West, uh, British Columbia with uh, over 5 million population, Vancouver as the business capital with uh, nearly three a million population. Victoria is a, a capital city on the Vancouver Island. Um, the strategic, strategic points uh, uh, for this, uh, for British Columbia is a geographic location because it's considered as a gateway to Asia Pacific. Uh, and also it's part of the Cascadia Innovation Corridor. That corridor uh, goes from British Columbia 
uh, uh, down south uh, in the United States to uh, Washington, Oregon, to California. So Washington and Oregon, those two states with uh, obviously, uh, as, as you know, uh, very, uh, in, where innovation is, uh, is very important uh, as it is in British Columbia. Um, it's con uh, considered um, this Cascadia Innovation uh, Corridor with companies such as um, uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Google, uh, and, and many, many more. Um, the digital uh, supercluster is located in Vancouver. That's, uh, it's called the Digital Supercluster of Canada. It's a huge tech hub, you know, a lot of startups. Uh, Vancouver is a top 25 um, uh, startup uh, hubs in the world. Um, but uh, British Columbia is considered Silicon Valley North. This is uh, uh, because of the, its proximity to, uh, to San Francisco. Uh, Hollywood North, because it's the third largest uh, cinema, cinematographic uh, center and film production center in North America, after Hollywood and, um, uh, and New York. And it's um, um, uh, clean tech and life sciences and ICT sectors are thriving. Uh, but you have to consider natural resources, very, very important uh, in the economy of uh, British Columbia, natural gas, uh, minerals, uh, mining, um, uh, forest uh, um, uh, products, uh, it's uh, forestry, it's uh, a very important industries. Um, when it comes to Alberta, 4.5 uh, million population, Calgary, Edmonton, the most important cities, natural resources, um, you know, obviously um, oil and gas, um, uh, agriculture, and, and innovation, uh, particularly med tech and ICT. Um, uh, some of the uh, some of the mo uh, most important opportunities uh, for the for the European companies uh, are uh, in in fact in uh, you know for, uh, for the reason of the construction steel construction would be in the mining sector um, natural gas uh, uh, clean tech uh, uh, and the transportation. Uh, here, I'm just quickly going to uh, just talk about the steel construction uh, market. Uh, the construction industry employs more than 1.4 uh, 1. million people in Canada, contributes uh, over 140 million to the Canadian economy, and uh, uh, construction is responsible for 7.5% of Canada's GDP. Uh, the construction jobs are in very high demand. Uh, and there's there's many many uh, interesting infrastructure projects uh, in the mostly industrial natural gas mines bridges highways uh, light rail uh, wind farms pipelines renewable energy projects and obviously residential um, Canada is funding uh, uh, in the next year is actually is, is 140 billion worth of infrastructure projects in the next uh, 10 years. Um, and how we can help as the chamber, we research potential business partners uh, for Portuguese companies and put you in contact with Canadian uh, construction companies and uh, uh, any business partners that you might be looking for. We facilitate uh, also employment and business relationships uh, between Portugal and Canada, uh, we identify public procurement opportunities in Canada on all level of government and set up, uh, we can also set up virtual office uh, uh, as your initial entry point to, uh, to test the waters, as, as I could say. How to reach us, uh, here's uh, our contact information. Um, uh, our website is www. EU-Canada.com. We invite you to uh, to contact us. I'm uh, uh, participating in a conference, so it can be contacted. Uh, uh, we have the virtual exhibition booth uh, at the CMM conference. And thank you very much again for the for the invitation. And I'd like to invite you uh, all to participate in the Portugal Canada uh, Steel Contra Construction Business Forum in uh, February of next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you.